forward. So again, welcome everyone to the 2021 Art Show and STEAM Expo. This is our third of six presentations over the course of two weeks. Uh, the goal is to bring our community and our students together and give our students pathways to community careers that exist. So um, we have heard from an engineer designer on Monday evening. He talked to us about uh, high complexity buildings and the challenges when you have an architect and an engineer and a detailer and a constructor all trying to work together on the same project. Um, and we had students present their constructions and their engineering design courses. Uh, last night we met with Francesco Gallerini. This is an architect who is an ASA grad 25 years ago, and he ended up working for the Armani Hotel in Dubai in the Burj Khalifa, uh, the world's tallest building. And we had some presentations last night from digital design students who shared with us the monuments that they created over the course of a unit. Uh, and this evening we're joined with, oh, excuse me, I just went a little too fast. We're joined with Claudia Rodriguez. And so Claudia Rodriguez is a plant biologist uh, who has studied in the United States and is the director of the Benjamin Franklin Science Corner, one of the main scientific dissemination institutions in Paraguay. Uh, the Ben Franklin Science Corner hosts a variety of activities, including experiments for children, talks, courses, workshops, thematic library, mini laboratory, and even technological innovation sessions. Uh, the Ben Franklin Science Corner was founded in 2013, thanks to collaboration and support between the Scientific Society of Paraguay and the United States Embassy in Asuncion. Uh, for Claudia, who has a background in genetic engineering, botany, and molecular biology, education in Paraguay will improve if science and technology are disseminated more widely. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our main speaker this evening, Claudia Rodriguez. If you'd like to just take over, you can screen share at any moment. All right. Thank you so, so much. I will stop um, sharing your screen, sharing my screen or with here and here we go. So if you see me sometimes looking over here, it's because I have two two screens and I'm I'm screening on on the other one, on the bigger one. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me again. This is the second time that I'm being invited for for the the conference. It's always been a pleasure to talk about a little bit of what I did and always um, to hopefully inspire hire some of you to do um, bio career and then it's always awesome too to find out and maybe why did I change careers because here in Paraguay I am a still a plant biologist but I'm working more on the education side of biology and um, community uh, bill so you will hear a little bit about both of my roles and how I have over the past 10 years, I graduated 10 years ago and how did I change? Um, how can someone change in 10 years? Sometimes you find that, what? But yes, it happens. Um, and it was kind of by accident, but it, I loved it. <laughs> and I'm still in it because I love it and I discovered that I could do this and it's awesome. One of the things that I live by is this Mm. saying that from Benjamin Franklin actually that says tell me and I forget teach me and I might learn I might um and I might remember involve me and I learn and I and I do this and I always show this to the new volunteers and even to the students that I'm working with because it's very important to know that the only way you can take and you can um, absorb um, everything that, that, that you are learning is if you get involved into the learning. And sometimes as teachers, um, ones tend to forget this. We think that, oh no, I'm just gonna go in there, do my class, and then that's it, they need to learn it. But sometimes that doesn't work. And especially here in Paraguay, we all know that schools are a little bit different. Um, and most, most everything is just, there's a lot of theory, but there's not a lot of practice going on. So one of the good things about the Science Corner is the Science Corner, imagine this of a makerspace, a free open lab. So anyone in the community can come and learn. So that's one of the best things about the, that I love about the Science Corner. But before going there, we need to talk about plant biology. So 
I I show this um, this what the major is because I usually give this talk to to other students, and and they don't know what it is. So <laughs> plan by and they tell me and and I'm telling you they don't know what it is because they usually bring me a little animal and then they give it to me and they say so tell me what what this is or they send me a picture and I'll be like. That's a very interesting picture, but I don't know what it is <laughs> because I'm actually a plant biologist. And I usually, I focus on the molecular side of biology. So I know a lot about DNA, how it works. Um, and sometimes um, why is it working the way it's working, but also in plants. My major was very, very, very specific. Um, I decided that I wanted I wanted to be a pre-med. So when I first got accepted into college, um, I I said to the advisor that as my father is a doctor and I wanted to help the people. So I realized that by being a, a pre-med, I was gonna be able to, I st you still have to have a major, especially in, in the US, and then you apply to medical school. So I decided I'm gonna go into pre-med, and then after that, I'm gonna go in, uh, I'm gonna go into medical school. So for pre-med, I wanted to do plant biology. But then I got passionate about plants, and I and then life took me somewhere else, and I end up being very very happy. So my major focused a lot on um, biochemistry and how to identify genes and how to work with genes in plants. So plants are pretty crazy. They're crazy. They're crazy people. I always tell them they're crazy. I talk to them. Yes, I do. I'm one of those crazy scientists that talks to them. And, and they tend to change. They're very plastic. It's what we call plastic. So their genes are very plastic. So they, they change all the time. They're continuously changing. And sometimes you will go into the lab and you will find something. And then the next day you will go again. And it's it um, or maybe two days afterwards. Of course, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, sometimes it does. And then it will change again. So I think that's one of the reasons why I decided to be a plant biologist too, because it was so awesome that it's a moving, 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 moving work all the time. And it's also, I was in charge of restoring this garden that you guys see here. This is a special garden. It's a serified garden. So basically what it means is that all the plants that are in there, they are all drought tolerant. That doesn't mean they do not need water. Please do not believe that. That only means that they take less water. Or sometimes they can go into um, maybe one or, or two um, weeks without water, but no more than that. They still need water. So we restored that garden with my wonderful group over here. And that was my first work and volunteer job and internship. So it was a little bit of everything, basically. Um, it was, I know it sounds simple, but it was very difficult. And the garden is pretty big. It, it has, I don't know how many species, but I was in charge of at least um, 50 and of course, you need to, and it's not too much 50, you need to know the botanical names and um, the species names, sometimes the variety names, and then you will get visitors and you have to uh, teach them why is it important and what do they need to plant this. One of the things that I see happening here in Paraguay right now is that uh, a lot of people are not working on how to, um, work with the environment and, and, and plant plants that are native from Paraguay, where um, it's very difficult. In fact, we don't have a nursery that has native plants. All our nurseries, they, they bring plants from Brazil, um, sometimes from Argentina, or sometimes they propagate through cuttings that they do, um, but they're all coming from Brazil and well, we're here, we have an 
immense biodiversity and we have some crazy things that I remember the first time I met them, I met them in a in the conservatory of flower, which is you will you will see a picture. I don't think I put a picture of that. But um but yeah, so so it's very interesting how how we have to evolve right now. And I'm I'm making this actually a personal effort to get more native plants planted in our gardens because I understand it's so awesome to have tulips in May in Paraguay. However, think about it. Tulips are not <laughs> from, um, from Paraguay. So they, they're not good for, they're not adapted to the weather. So, you know, um, I don't think they will ever become invasive, but I've been talking up with a lot of other biologists that are actually working on invasive species of plants. And a lot of the things that we see now with the grasses and with some trees, they're actually non-native plants, they're actually invasive plants that came through who knows how, but they're establishing themselves and they're actually killing the natural native plants that we have. So we have to be very careful with that. Um, in Davis, they are super careful about that. And, and I think everywhere in other states too, I think, but I know California is a big proposal because they have so many invasive plants coming from all over the place, which brings me to my first job as a plant biologist. I work at Maron Bio Innovations. It's a biotech company, but in there, I was in charge of developing, um, all, all my work was in the greenhouse and I work with this um, chemical that you see here that is called regalia. And what we were trying to do is actually, we were trying to kill this invasive species um, through what it's called integrated pest management. Um, and what you do is you try to kill using this pesticide, but this pesticide is actually environmentally friendly. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but you know, in the first place, and honestly, those weeds, they shouldn't be there. And they got there because someone thought, oh my gosh, how cute, I want this in my garden. And then they came to California and then they became invasive. And now it's a problem and it's a problem for all the other farmers that are there trying to um, grow their crops and it's a problem. Um, for not only the U.S., but from many parts in the world, because California is one of the biggest suppliers of food in the world. I think it's the fifth. So anything that comes in California um, and, it's, it's, it's <laughs> and that has to do with agriculture is, is pretty hard. Um, I, I enjoy working here. I was in charge of growing lettuce, and I, was, um, I love lettuce. Um, I always make fun of myself because I say I'm an expert on lettuce, on like growing little seedlings of lettuce. Um, but it was fun. And then this plant that you see here um, is cotton. So I was also growing that. And now you don't see that much here in Paraguay, but before everywhere was cotton and now they don't plant it. They have um, replaced it with soy. So we were taking care of that. Um, and I always show my picture of me wearing an N95 because at my lab was a level three security, biosecurity. So you always needed to be covered and you always needed to have a face mask at all times. So the pandemic just remind me of, oh, I used to do this. That's right. As a living, <laughs> so it doesn't really bother me, basically. And then I became, after um, being after being in my own bio, I got another job as a as an agronomist, more likely than a biologist. But I became a plant breeder assistant um, for the United States and Europe. So it this is a big job, and it's a lot. <laughs> And I always, I, 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 this is one of my, it, I love mar working on Maroon, but I knew it was only, I was only making impact in like the rice growers around California. But for Maroon, uh, for Pioneer, I got to work with wonderful people in Europe and also in Hawaii. 
Um, we will not see each other, but we will we will teleconference all the time. At that time, Zoom didn't exist yet, so everything was uh, conferencing through the phone. And I got to meet this wonderful, wonderful scientists, especially in Egypt, in Turkey. I love them because um, they've been working with sunflowers all their life. So it was awesome to talk to them. And besides that, they, they're they not only like this super top cool scientists, but they're also doing all this work to feed the world. And basically what we're trying to discover is a new, not new variety, but we're trying to get varieties into the market that are very high in oil. That's, that was our purpose. And my job specifically was to do all the registrations for these new varieties. So what I tell to, pe to people is, or to, the, to my students or my volunteers is like, I was in charge of getting to know who was the mommy and who was the daddy of the new uh, child or this new seed. It's actually a seed that I had. And I, you have to present that into a board of um, uh, members in, in Europe and in the US, and then they need to approve that. So you need to write all the registrations. You need to take a lot of data um, because sunflowers, I know they just look like a little flower that is in the field and it's usually orange. I mean, that's what people think. And the color of the leaves are usually green. That's what they say. But in fact, there is more like seven types of greens, um, more than 10 colors of orange that they can have. So, and it's very interesting. And also the seed type is very interesting. They come, some of them that are striped, some of them that are not. And then you also need to measure the thin stripe, how thick they are. Um, so it, it was a very interesting job. I mean, um, I've never thought I would know so much about sunflowers. Unfortunately, we also, we, we plant this, but I know we do it in Encarnacion and in some other places. We don't have it around here, Asuncion, so you don't really see it. And then my favorite, ultimate favorites were the wild sunflowers. So sunflowers are plants that have um, evolved all the way from um, in North America and also in Europe. It's from the North Hemisphere. So, but they come in so many different shapes and colors. It's so amazing. And I just used to go to the nursery in the summer, actually in June Ju and July. And everything was covered full of blooms, bees and spiders, but I'm not afraid of them. I only scream when I see one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was that, that job, it was one of my favorite. I stayed there for like almost three years. And then I decided to come to Paraguay. And then you will ask me, what would you do that for? And the thing is, I decided to come back because I wanted to spend time with my family and I wanted my son to grow, to grow with his family. And, and it was awesome. And that's how I accidentally, because like my friend sent the, sent the job application and told me, you should apply to this job because you are a scientist and they're looking for a scientist. And I was like, sure, no problem. And that's how I got into the US Embassy and the Benjamin Franklin Science Corner. So we are classified as an American space and I worked directly with the um, US government and I work directly with Washington right now. And what we do is we try to promote uh, culture and in, in the case of the Science Corner, we try to promote the, um, the sciences here in Paraguay and how can scientists from Paraguay can work with scientists in the US. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, it is, I love it. Uh, we started uh, with almost nothing, as you can see um, here in the pictures. Um, it's like, I hope I'm still sharing my screen, Tyler. Can you confirm? Because I don't see the, the blue. 
we see about uh, five photos here. They like the tables oh. with the, the boxes. And then we have the two photos on the bottom with the tables exactly. and the shelves in the back. Mm -hmm. there we yes, see we all. Uh, so first it was just a couple of experiments, just like so we can have fun and we can we can see. And now um, my picture looks more like the bottom. My office looks more than the bottom. I, I changed my office recently. Um, we have CNCs, we have 3D printers now, we have biology equipment, we also have microscopes, which we, we didn't have before, like the first years. So for me, that was, it's incredible because anyone, seriously, anyone can go and use a microscope. We were close last year, but this year what I'm doing is like I'm receiving visitors by appointment. So if I will make an appointment in advance and then I will make sure everything is okay and then we will have visitors, but we only get, you know, up to five people to visit us. And now we have a new room and that is a little bit bigger. And, you know, I mean, also besides of being at the Science Corner, since it's so small and there's only so much you can do and really, really, really the necessity for us as Paralyans is to go out there and talk about science and try to get to people into science. And what, one thing that you need to understand, and even if you are this young, is um, when you're still in high school or you are in middle school, even in, in the first years of, of school, you need to understand that science, especially if you're teaching or if you're a scientist, science is not gonna, um, People are not gonna go into science. You as a scientist need to go to the people. And I always tell that to my biggest scientists because sometimes they think that because of their scientists it's like, no, if they have any questions, they're gonna come. Um, I noticed that very, very, very fast when I started working at the corner, um, people were afraid um, they felt intimidated, especially at schools, they felt intimidating, even the teachers, they felt intimidating just to come and visit the science corner because I have so many things that they probably, the, previously they never saw it. And then now it's like they, we were doing an experiment and they see all these glasses and, you know, they see the earlier major flask, they see a beaker and it's, this is the first time that they see that. So for them it was mind blowing that I had all this and then they could use it. So that's how we decided to create this, some of the programs that we have. Um, the Shaka was one of the most successful programs. We did, um, we organized this science and opportunity fairs around the country. We did five of them with the Fulbright Association. And these are full, the Fulbright Associations are all the Fulbrighters that got the scholarship and then they came back to Paraguay and started working. And they are doing amazing things. So I'm still working with them. We have another program going on right now with them and it's it's pretty crazy how we started with this program and they always tell me this is like you barely um knew us and you still accepted to work with us and i was like i was so desperate to get um science outside the schools science just to everyone that i was like i'll do it and i'll see what happens it turns out they are a wonderful group of people to work with. All of them are incredible. I mean, I love them. So we did this first, as you can see, I work with a lot of STEAM, all the other people from STEAM, not only the full writers. We have um, Rodi, we also have all the innovators. I have so many people. Poparawai, that's how we started working together. Um, Actually, the, one of the founders of Pop Paraguay used to volunteer for me. And when I met him, he was working. He was one of the only people working with 3D printers. And he always told me he had this idea of printing this and giving to the people. So, so it was great that we found each other and we started working. That, that was awesome for me. 
And then the other program that I'm working on right now, um, it's the GLOVE program. This is more a biology related program than all the other ones are very techy. This one, you can make it techy if you want it, but if you don't, it's, it's okay, it's fine. Um, so for, for this is you work on educational projects and environmental projects. Right now we have an app and it's a citizen science app that you can download. It's called the Globe Observer and you can take measurements of the clouds, you can take measurements of the mosquitoes and you can take measurements of just uh, trees and they're probably gonna open up more and contribute those um, observations to NASA. So basically this program, the GLOVE program, that is called Global Learning Observations for the Benefit of the Environment, works directly with NASA. And what they do is they, they share information. And before it used to be only for schools and now it's like open to the citizens. So that's, and that's called what is called the new uh, big wave of, of you know, learning experiences that is called citizen science. It's very awesome, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, we're doing a lot of work with um, other communities here in Asuncion, but um, people that are working at the Costanera or now we are working with Banco San Miguel and we're gonna start doing this. So it's gonna be super cool. And then the other programs that we, we are starting back again because last year we stopped and this year it's like we're starting we're starting to go to the community again at least to see a few of the girls that remind is uh, programs only for girls as you know we are very interested in having girls going into science um, especially because it's like not every, not all the girls, they, they go to science or they pursue a science career. So one of my jobs is also to, you know, just to talk about and see it's like, these are all the opportunities that you have as a girl. And I work with very underserved communities. Like I work with the Chagarita Community Center. And now I'm working with the Banco San Miguel that, if you guys know, uh, Banco San Miguel is not even a place where humans should be living because it's basically a bank in the river. But there's actually around, what is that? I think there's around 57 families that are living there. And they're constantly um, at risk of being flooded. And what they do is like whenever the river goes up, they just move to um, to a regular house, to a house built in with wood, and then they come back once the river goes down. Um, we went there um, three times already. It's an amazing community. They are very awesome and they're very interested in education. Actually, I, I am because I've been working with the Chacarita and the Chacarita it comes in, you have the middle of the Chacarita and then you have Chacarita Baja, which is the lower part of the Chacarita and Chacarita Alta. And I, throughout the years, these eight years, I've been working with all of them. And what I, I found amazing at the Banco San Miguel is that everyone wants their kid to go to school and they are desperate to find people that will come and help them study. So right now we open a program that is just called, um, what is it that we were going, Apoyo Escolar, which basically means just like, um, it's a support that, that, that these kids will have because most of them they are in um, first, second, third and fourth grade. Um, they don't have anyone. They only have, I think a, a few of the young students that are seventh, eighth and ninth graders. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to teach them math, social uh, skills, and I don't, I think it's like grammar. That's the, that's the only thing that are doing in, in their school because everything is, they don't, their school closed because of not only the flooding, but because of the pandemic, their school closed. So basically they had to um, go to different schools around the area and 
this is what they found, but because the, the moms are not there, they receive, um, they're doing their classes via WhatsApp. And only the ninth graders, I think, are the ones that from time to time, they, they get to get connected through Zoom and they do Zoom. But they're not understanding what they're what's going on because basically they just print some they need to go they need to, first of all they need to get out of the community which is very difficult they need to find somewhere to print their whatever the teacher sent and then they complete that they take a picture and then they send it to the teacher so i feel bad for the students and the teachers <laughs> uh, but that's what they're doing and they're not under they're not understanding the concepts they're not they don't have any reading comprehension so we're gonna do, go there and we're gonna try to help them see what else we can build with them and of course we're always gonna have all these other activities for them like we have sexual education we also have an art program that we do with them and i usually try to do art and science i don't just go with art because you know everything is science for me. So I always make sure in my programs, I include that. So it's been great. And these are some of the girls from the community center from the Chacarita. And it's one of the visits that we received from NASA um, that we got a super duper cool scientist visiting us for like a day. And it was awesome that she came and talked to the girls. And now they're, they're, they're still going to the science corner from time to time, I see them. But one of the things that I ask, um, at least uh, more, uh, all the girls you see here, they're still in school and they're still, they're trying to go into the university. So basically through this program, because I keep in touch with them, I write to them in WhatsApp, I ask them how they are, I do all that. And, and through the program of being in the peer mentoring and just going to the science corner and seeing, and seeing something totally different from their reality day by day, they're able to stay in school. And I think that's one of the most important things for me. Um, again, the other program that we have here is Shesa and me. This one, it's, um, it's in Coronel Oviedo. Also, same thing, it's with the Fulbright Association. And we're trying to have these girls, all of them, they're still in the program, but they're going on their second year and they're in seventh grade. So we do videos, we send them the videos. Once a month, we visit them. And then once we visit them, we give them the, their experiments and then they can perform the experiments with them and then they send us their feedback. So I know they're super cool. They're super enthusiastic. They love working and they love doing science. Uh, we're talking about that. Um, and this is like the latest, what we had to do because of the pandemic uh, uh, through with the embassy. Um, this program was designed uh, with the volunteers from the science corner and was curated to by them. And basically is you have, it's, a, it's called Americana Box and kids with low or no connectivity, they receive a box. And in this box, they will find two experiments and then they do the experiments. It comes with instruction on how to do the experiments, but it also comes with, I mean, you can also see the videos on YouTube. So you have the two options. If you wanna watch the video, you can watch the video or you can read the instructions. Most of the, most of the kids or most of the communities that we are getting, they know um, they are going for the, for the instructions. Last year we have 90 kids, and this year we are getting, we're doing 210. So we increase this year, more people are interest, interested. Basically the embassy put up an application and the community leaders and all their NGOs, they had to apply and then once they receive, um, and that's how they receive the, the boxes. So this program is, is another program we did also thinking of what can we do to help since we are so far out, apart now and I, I don't get to see most of them. Um, just talk a little bit about the results, what had happened in this 
eight years is that a lot of the volunteers or students, not only they pursue us, I mean, some of them, they pursue a science career, but some of them, they don't. But one of the things is um, several of the students are going into the sciences, thanks to the science corner. So this is my big community. We have, we have around 100 volunteers, but probably, you know, just um, right now, probably 30 volunteers are active. Then the rest is like they participate in our programs. We have a conversation club in English, for example, and they're participating because pretty soon they're gonna, some of them are gonna take the SAT, some of them are designed not to, but they still have to take the TOEFL. So because of that, we're doing, you know, English. And it was it was much easier with me when they will go to the office because then I'll be the one talking to them in English. And now it's like, we have to do it through a Zoom. And it's, it's still fun. So in case you want to know more about us, so that, that was, this is my last slide, but I will put it up here a little bit for a little bit. Um, uh, if you want to know more about us and our work, what we're doing, where we're going, you can follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. We have everything. So we got all the social media covered. There used to be a time where we had Snapchat. I don't know what happened. Well, I, I do know I stopped posting, <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> Claudia, I want to say thank you so much for everything. I think it's an understatement to say that you really are a gem for this community and all the connections that you're making and lives that you're making better. And um, the way that you're using your experiences and helping other people connect to their dreams is really phenomenal. And so it's an honor to know you and it's an honor to have you as part of our community here. And I really hope that some of the challenges that you identify, we can give to our students and hope that they can come up with solutions or volunteer their time or try to help out in, in a more authentic way. And like you said, you know, it's not always about theoretical, it's about taking action and taking practice and getting our kids in middle school and high school to go beyond the theory and take action to improve their communities. So again, thank you so much for your time. We're also joined this evening by two of our high school students. Um, both girls are in ninth grade. Uh, they're taking biology class, Anna Chung and Pilar Jano. So we're going to hear from a couple student projects next. And then after that, it's going to be an open question and answer time. Uh, I know that both of our um, student presenters have some questions for Claudia. So we'll, we'll wait and hold those questions for a little bit. So at this point, uh, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. I'm going to take over and I'm going to share a presentation of Anna's so that you'll be able to see it. And then Anna, you are fine to go ahead and tell us about your project. So for biology class, we were assigned to make an advertisement for COVID vaccines. I chose Russia's Sputnik V vaccine. And to grab attention, I put a big headline with saying 91.6 accuracy the vaccine consists of two parts. They're taken 21 days apart. The first vaccine targets humoral cellular immunity, which is when with assistance from helper T cells, B cells will differentiate into plasma B cells that can produce antibodies against a specific antigen. And the second vaccination forms memory cells. So when the patient or the person gets COVID, the body remembers how to fight against it. I believe an estimated 4,000 doses were sent to Paraguay. And more specifically or easily to explain how the vaccine works, it's basically a cold type virus created. It is injected to the body and so the body is ready to fight against COVID. Is it trustworthy? A, a trial was made with 22,000 adults and it was confirmed that there were no serious side effects and there hasn't been any death cases. That's about it. What was the uh, reason that you chose this vaccine? Uh, this one being the, uh, the Russian one and how is this one 
Um, maybe just to dig a little bit deeper for fun. How is this one different than the other ones? Are they all the same kind? Like you said, this one is a cold type virus. I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit more like why this one versus the other ones? Um, I chose the vaccine because I did not know at that time that there were a version of doses if you have to take 21 days apart or there are there is one in Paraguay currently that people with older ages are taking, which are, I believe, a month apart or three months, I think it was. And this one is only 21 days. So I found it very interesting. And different from the other ones, I don't think there is much difference in how it works or what the goal of the vaccine is, I believe all pretty much all the vaccines are antibodies to fight the covid virus cool thank you so much for sharing this uh we'll maybe loop back to this when we get to the question and answer section if anyone has questions on this it's really interesting that the project is not just about um you know uh, what is the vaccine but how can we have some social advocacy with the vaccine how can we actually get the message out to convince people to make our communities safer Cool, thank you so much. Uh, Pilar, we're gonna turn it over to you at this point. We have a quick presentation that we're gonna watch and then we'll follow it up with question and answer afterwards. So here we go. Let me just grab the play button. Rock Pocket Mice by Pilar Llano. This year in Ms. Barnett's class, I became more aware of the concept of evolution. Before having her biology class, I did not have a clear understanding of these changes over time. However, her class this year taught me so much, including the Hardy-Weinberg theorem. This theorem states that a population is in equilibrium when five conditions are met. These are the following. The population is vast and well mixed. There is no migration. There are no mutations. Mating is random. And lastly, there is no natural selection. If all these are met and there is no change in the gene pool, the population is not evolving. To determine whether a population's gene pool is changing, we need to calculate allelic frequencies. To calculate these, we use two equations. The first one is P plus Q equals one. The dominant P and the recessive Q must equal one. The second equation is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. The p squared indicates homozygous dominant alleles. The q squared refers to homozygous recessive alleles. And the 2pq represents the heterozygous alleles found in the gene pool. These added up together should also equal 1. We had to find the frequency of alleles in the rock bucket mice population during class. So we apply these concepts. This was a problem. First of all, we have to read and comprehend what information we are given. The question says, in a hypothetical population consisting of 100 rock pocket mice, five individuals have light colored fur. Their genotype is QQ. The other 95 individuals have dark colored fur and have either genotype PP or genotype PQ. Find P and Q for this population and calculate the frequency of heterozygous genotypes. So we already know that Q squared is equal to 5% because it's given to us. However, in order to get Q, we have to find the square root of 0 0.05, which is 0 0.22. Now that we know Q's value, we can figure out P's value. If P plus Q equals one, then we simply subtract 0 0.22 from 1 and notice that P is equal to 0 0.78. Since we know the value of P and Q, we can easily calculate the frequency of heterozygous genotypes using the hardy weinberg equation. The product of P 0 0.78 and Q 0 0.22 multiplied by 2 is the frequency of heterozygous genotypes, which is 0.34. After solving the equations, we observed that 95% of the rock pocket mice population is dark colored. If we compare it to the gene pool from 100 years ago, we would have probably noticed that only 5% were dark colored. 
This is because the dark colored mice had a selective advantage over the light colored mice when located in dark colored substrates due to the new conditions of dark lava. The light colored mice were more notable to their predators, causing them to decrease suddenly. On the other hand, the dark colored mice kept increasing because they kept passing down their genes. This was due to natural selection. Therefore, evolution did occur. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, at this point, let's just open it up to questions. And so, Anna, I know you had a question for uh, Mrs. Rodriguez. Oh, excuse me, my uh, camera is off there. Uh, Anna, I know you had a question for Mrs. Rodriguez earlier. Pilar, you did as well. And then maybe Mrs. Rodriguez, if you have any questions or clarifications on their presentations or just comments in general about the amazing things that our kids are doing. Pilar, I just want to add, I love seeing the math in the presentation. That made me so happy. As a previous <laughs> math teacher, when you got the, the square root of 0 0.05 correct, not saying like it's 0 0.25, it's actually the correct value that made me happy. Uh, Anna, let's take it over. What, what question do you have that you want to ask for Mrs. Rodriguez? So while Ms. Rodriguez was presenting, I wrote down some questions. My first question is, what does your daily life look like currently right now in quarantine? Very busy. <laughs> Okay, so I, I start up, I, I make up, let's see, let's talk last year, and then I'll talk a little bit about this year. So last year, basically what I did was, um, you can see it in the background over there, um, that's a 3D printer. Basically, last year, everything closed, and we have four 3D printers. I had, I didn't bring four of them because I don't have room. This is about one, one bedroom apartment. So I brought two printers home, uh, the easiest one, and then two other ones, um, I gave it to the National University so they can continue to work. And what we did is like all of us, everyone that had a, owned a 3D printer, we all came together as Paraguayans and we worked to print 3D um, face shield masks. That's what, what we were doing last year. I was printing um, for 24 hours, actually. So basically, I had a printing schedule. I will start printing at, uh, um, I will print from 12 p.m. until 9 p.m. And then from 9 to 12 a.m., I will just print the other part because it had a, it had a, it had a two uh, part thing and then at night I will put the printer at 12 a.m. and start working from 12 I mean the printer was working but I went to bed at one um, and, and then it will finish at 9 a.m. so that was my thing and I will start working at 10 a.m. and I designed the Americana box and I also designed, uh, I project manage, manager like the Americana box and the Shesu and me. But I pick all, all the questions. Um, I, I pick all the experiments and I picked um, everything that we had to do. Also, I was contacting people and also I was contacting my volunteers because of course, because of the pandemic, some of them went into um, depression and it was, it, my job is not only to teach them, it also means that I have to be with them. So last year I had it pretty hard. And now this year, ah, and I'm a single parent. So I have an um, eight year old and he um, was going to bilingual school, but we had to stop that because I didn't have time to be. So I basically hire a private tutor and he, she is tutoring him. And this year we're continuing with that. And he, he has classes in the afternoon. Um, he has classes and I still, sometimes he goes with me to work and he's doing in his classes while I'm working. Um, but right now my work consists um, just like creating all these programs, continuing creating these programs virtually, and then trying to see when can we actually open to the public so we can start working with the 
with the kids again. So that's my day. It's pretty hectic, but I'm still checking on volunteers and I'm still checking off um, my communities because I have students that are you guys' age, like they're 14, 15s and they're from the Chacarita and they have no classes. Um, I mean, they have their classes through WhatsApp, but um, I'm still checking on them to see what, what they're doing, how they're doing. And when are they coming? I mean, next week, they're probably going to go to the office. We're going to do some experiments, see what we can blow up at the science corner. I have chemicals. I'm not. <laughs> but I usually blow up some stuff just to make me feel good. <laughs> uh, Pilar, do you have any questions for Mrs. Rodriguez? Um, no questions. They were already answered. There's a question that we have in the chat. It's actually from Mrs. Barnett. She said, um, she was wondering, Mrs. Rodriguez, if you uh, could give any advice for these two girls that we have here, Anna and Pilar, just like career advice, if you could maybe give them some insights on what careers they might want to pursue in the future or point them as you do with some of your other. Yeah, just take that. So hopefully they continue to do biology. Biology is awesome. It's actually very, very broad. So don't close yourself just because you think, oh, this is biology. And most people in Paraguay, if you talk to a biologist in Paraguay, most of them are doing conservation of biology, which is awesome. And we need to be doing that. But I always say we need more people doing conservation of biology um, and also computational biology. So if you want to know where the future is, um, I think the future is going to be, and, and there are a lot of uh, like papers coming up right now, trying to support this idea, everything, especially in biology with CRISPR-Cas. I, I don't know if you guys talked about that in school yet. Um, you know, uh, some teachers, um, they can, it, it's kind of, it's, it's a hard topic to introduce, but um with CRISPR-Cas, we're gonna need more people doing computational biology. And in fact, I have one of the biotechnology as friends that I have, uh, she, she, we used to work together and she's doing computational biology. She's actually, her job, even though she's a biotech major, her job as a biologist, she, she works in a biology lab and what she is doing is she's trying using mathematical models. So she's using those mathematical models and trying to find new drugs to discover to cure certain diseases. So her job is pretty awesome. She's gonna be a PhD. I mean, she applied, she got accepted. So I think, um, that's, that's very interesting. And then um, one of the volunteers that got accepted into Stanford, even though she is an applied mathematics uh, major, she is actually working with biologists because they're, when, uh, they're trying to figure it out how um, populations move across many years and they use computational biology to, to do that too. So she always gives me a hard time because I used to give her a hard time and say like, oh, it's like, ah, you are gonna go into engineering and you're gonna leave me and I don't have any biology biologist with me. And I used to say, I used to complain a lot about that, but actually I do have a bi biologist people. I have like three or four that are going into biology. And <laughs> so, so they laugh because of that. And she's now she's like, well, I guess you were right. Biology is important. Who would have thought that I would start doing work with biologists, <laughs> even though I'm a applied math major <laughs> so, and physicist. She has two majors. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so as a heads up, we've um, we just spent an evening with Claudio Rodriguez here. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be joined with a medical doctor to continue the biology conversation a little bit forward, more forward. Uh, Dr. Fernando Elias is gonna be joining us for an evening chat about medical science and biology in the Sunsion during the time of COVID-19. 
Uh, we're going to take a break on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, we'll be back, and we're going to hear from ASU Maspe and Sistema Bay, which is all about community development and innovation, and their specific neighborhood of Santissima Trinidad here in Asuncion. And then on Tuesday, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Jorge Curita. He's the engineering director of the Paraguayan Space Agency, and we're going to learn the story behind the Guarani Sat-1 satellite. Claudia, thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been a pleasure to be with you. Um, we're trying to do our best design innovative solutions and with a community contact like you, we know we can have a clearer vision uh, for what's needed now and in the future. And so I just want to say thank you again so much. Uh, thanks again to all of our presenters as well. Um, it doesn't look like there's any other questions at this point, so we're going to wrap it up. Have a fantastic evening, everyone. All the best. We'll be in touch and have a great night. All the best. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye. -bye.